Thank you, and thank you very much to the organizers for having invited me. Uh, so I wanted to say something briefly just about uh, why I'm here because it was a little bit undermining. So my colleague, Simone Chambers, when she was reading through the program and saw me on it, she said, what, what are you doing to this conference for? And um, I said, come on, I'm a huge Taylorian. He was, <laughs> and she said, really? I've never really seen that in you. Um, so I thought I'd say just a few brief things about the ways in which uh, Charles Taylor influenced me because he very much deeply influenced um, uh, me in a variety of ways. So I was an undergraduate at McGill in the late 1980s, um, probably did half my degree between Professors Taylor and Tully, um, probably half my course credits were in their courses. Um, uh, Professor Taylor was also my undergraduate thesis supervisor, which is why I don't have any Chuck stories, I only have Professor Taylor stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you will always be Professor Taylor. Um, but uh, I, I, read, I realized in retrospect that uh, he was an extremely indulgent uh, thesis supervisor uh, in that he let me write a 90-page uh, paper on Habermas and why Habermas was right and so forth. Um, but they also, Professors Taylor and Tully at the time, were co-teaching uh, graduate seminars, which I think was in many ways a sort of golden age of, of at least political philosophy in Canada. Um, and they also allowed me to attend their graduate seminars as an undergraduate, which was an enormous learning opportunity. Um, and so at the time, a number of them, um, I was always too afraid to say anything in those uh, seminars, but I was listening very carefully. Um, and uh, so there's a number of, you know, a lot of the influences were, were more uh, personal influences in terms of like as a role model of how to be a philosopher, how to be intellectual. But um, there were some elements of doctrine that I also um, uh, took to be uh, learned, uh, took to be true and continued to take to be true. Uh, and in particular, they were learned at the time. And so there were two ideas in, and one, so one of the seminars that they taught was on the sources of the self when it just came out. Uh, and there were two ideas um, there that struck me very, very forcefully and that continue to be really central to my views. Um, and um, the first then was a, and you know, this has to do with, with moral philosophy. The title of the talk is The Status of Abstract Moral Concepts. Um, my view on the nature of abstract moral concepts was essentially learned um, in, 25 years ago uh, in this seminar. So the first was the suspicion of axiomatization in, in moral philosophy uh, and in moral theory. So. Um, you know, as an undergraduate, if we, you do an introduction to moral philosophy and you read Kant and you read Mill, um, you can sort of just take it for granted that, that it's a natural thing to want to have a supreme principle of morality, uh, because that's what seems to be what everybody's up to. Um, and nobody ever sort of says why there should be a supreme principle of morality, but everyone seems to be assuming that there should be one, so you just kind of go with that. Um, and so early on in Source of the Self, um, Professor Taylor takes issue with that, and as soon as he says it, it immediately struck me as being correct. Um, but there was also a deeper thought, which is that there was an there's an accusation there that what goes on with the development of these principles is actually a type of, of gerrymandering. Um, and that people, as it were, and everyone understands sort of characteristically how contemporary moral philosophy, analytic moral philosophy is done, which is you come up with some kind of principle, and then you test it against a variety of intuitions or cases to see if it can explain them. Um, and then, you know, there are some cases that it works well, and then you go to a seminar and someone comes up with this hard case that you can't really explain, and you try to reformulate your principle and so forth. Um, so you, you sort of make this thing up, and you try to get it to produce the right answers. And then the fundamental question um, that Professor Taylor raised is, well, how is it that you already know what the right answer is prior to the formulation of your principle? Like, what exactly is the grounds of what you're using to test your principle? And if you already know what the right answer is, then why formulate the principle? Why not instead focus directly on the right answer and your knowledge of that right answer? And instead of trying to come up with some kind of principle that could, for example, like trick the moral skeptic into believing in morality or something like that, why not just directly try to articulate the grounds of your essential conviction? Um, and so that, Modern moral philosophy from that perspective starts to look like a type of self-imposed inarticulacy. That is, instead of going directly to your moral convictions and trying to articulate them, you're doing this sort of clever thing, um, which ultimately is a, 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 an attempt at articulation, but it's a bad attempt at articulation because it's not moving directly to it. Um, the second then element of doctrine, which I took away from this, um, was a thesis about sort of the status of moral concepts and where morality lives. And that was the claim that first and foremost, morality lives in our practices um, and is transmitted culturally and historically. Um, and along with that came a thesis then about what moral philosophers are doing when they, as it were, supply their trade. Um, and that fundamentally what they're doing is expressing, uh, is introducing expressive vocabulary as a way of articulating what's implicit in these practices. Um, and Resulting from this is actually a kind of an error theory of moral philosophy or of metaethics. In other words, it's not an error theory as a position in metaethics, but rather it's an error theory of sort of what philosophers who do metaethics are up to. That is, they misunderstand their own concepts. 
they take themselves to be in crafting this expressive vocabulary, discovering something about the deep structure of morality. Um, and there's a fundamental error there in terms of exactly what it is that they're describing and trying to get at. Um, so that was an idea that, that struck me rather forcefully. And um, there's, you could find a, a, an expression of a similar sort of analysis in Robert Brandom's work. Um, when he comes up with a name for it, which I like, which is that of the formalist fallacy. Uh, the example, and by the way, so there's all this stuff about expressive vocabulary and so forth. Um, I guess now you always have to remember people, like, this is not the expre expressivism in the sort of Simon Blackburn, Gibbard way. Um, it's expressivism in the Taylorian sense. Um, so Branham has a similar analysis, and he has what for me is a very clarifying analysis of uh, the development of the conditional in logic, because Branham takes the conditional as being a classic example of expressive vocabulary. So the thought is that um, you know, we've always been able to make inferences, and every language uh, has the capacity to make inferences because of the constitutive role of inference in linguistic meaning. So you can make inferences. Inferences are something that you can do, but it's not necessarily something that you can state. And so when you introduce the conditional into your language, so if-then locutions or implies or whatever, what it allows you to then do is to state explicitly something that you could previously only do implicitly. So you could move from A and then you could assert B, but with the condition, you could then say A implies B. Um, this, however, generates the possibility of, um, of this formalist fallacy, which is that having now introduced this new vocabulary, uh, you mistakenly believe that this expressive vocabulary that you've introduced in order to talk about what you're doing is actually a discovery of what you were doing all along. And so people begin to think that back in the day before they had the conditional, as it were, they were always using it, but the, all of their inferences were enthymematic. There was a suppressed premise in them. So we thought we were going from A to B, but in fact, we were committed to A, and we were committed to A implies B, and that we were getting to B through detachment. Right? So the A implies B vocabulary, which is expressive, right? it's layered over the fundamental practice, gets reinterpreted as being something that was actually underneath it, that it's a piece of machinery that was actually doing the work all along. And I think you could apply a similar analysis in moral philosophy that, for example, what's going on in Kant's discussion of the categorical imperative is very, is very similar. That if, you know, if the categorical imperative had worked, uh, in the res if it had actually sort of handled the cases, people would have said, aha, this is what was actually doing all the work all along when we were making moral judgments. Now, if you adopt this perspective, I think it leads you to see a number of um, old debates uh, in moral philosophy in an entirely new way. Um, so if you look at the standard way in which analytic moral philosophy is done, you know, the contemporary debates between consequentialism and evaluative vocabulary and deontological vocabulary. Um, people are, have their particular theory, they have all these cases, they have all these intuitions, they're trying to sort of show that they can handle all these cases without exception and so forth. But if you start to look at these as simply just rival expressive vocabularies, you start to see that no progress is going to be made at that level. Why? Because these vocabularies have been developed and refined um, over the course of centuries. They're incredibly rich vocabularies. And there's very good reason to think that anything that can be articulated in one vocabulary, say a consequentialist vocabulary, could be reinterpreted and rearticulated in a deontological vocabulary. Um, they're both extremely capacious vocabularies. And so a lot of it is people saying one thing and then people just re-saying what that person said. Um, but thinking that you could actually sort of win that argument because these are actually theories accounting for facts as opposed to simply more or less robust expressive vocabularies. Now, when I present this idea to uh, colleagues who do this type of moral philosophy, uh, they're extremely resistant to this analysis. Um, <laughs> um, and the reason that they're uh, resistant to the analysis uh, is that they think that if you accept this analysis, you simply cannot do moral philosophy. Um, you cannot inquire into, into um, the nature of moral judgment. Um, and I think that uh, Taylor's work shows very forcefully a way in which you can still do moral philosophy having accepted this analysis. Um, and um, it has to do with the sort of fundamental method of argumentation that he deploys. Uh, so, so now I'm going to digress into a Professor Taylor story. Um, so, uh, which illustrates the method, uh, which is that when, so when we were undergrads, um, undergrads always Probably grad students do it too, but anyhow, they always sort of make fun of their professors. Um, so, so we had this sort of Professor Taylor joke um, uh, when we were 20 years old, and it went something like this. Um, it was sort of uh, a vignette. It was like the, the experience of asking Professor Taylor a question in class. Um, and so you're sitting there for a couple weeks, and you, 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 know, you, you finally sort of pluck up your courage, and um, you stick up your hand, you say, but, and then you ask some sort of incredibly crude sort of jejune objection to what he just said. Um, 
And, um, and so expecting to sort of get directly crushed. Um, and then what he does is he responds, he says, he says, that's very interesting. He says, <laughs> if I understand you correctly, that what you are articulating is in fact an incredibly powerful current of thought um, in the modern era. They, I mean, if I think really, sorry, I do the gesture. To, um, <laughs> underlying that, underlying the question is, of course, a, a worldview about nature as mechanism that that gets articulated, I think, very forcefully in the early Enlightenment, de la Matri, um, but probably reaches its highest expression in Dolbach. Um, <laughs> I, I hope I'm not misunderstanding you terribly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so your 20-year-old self says, yeah, 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 that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I, I mean, I, you know, I maybe wasn't thinking of Dolbach explicitly, but that's, <laughs> That's absolutely where I was coming from. <laughs> and they'll say, I see, I see. This is very, it's a very interesting question. Just, see, and you know, the, the motivations I, are very powerful motivations underlying that view, but um, just unfortunately, and then he's like where the hammer drops, right? Um, <laughs> so this, this entire perspective was really just subject to just a devastating refutation by Herder. Um, <laughs> and sadly, I mean, really, particularly with the publication of the Nachlass, I think people became to realize that this just wasn't a tenable position. Um, so, but thank you so much. It's a, it's a, um, <laughs> so you say, oh, wow, gee, so I didn't realize that. Um, and you say, yeah, I haven't gotten around to reading the knock loss yet. Um, <laughs> anyhow. Um, so the, the, uh, I'm actually not lying. So this is a joke we used to tell um, 25 years ago. But uh, over time, I came to realize that that's actually the philosophical method. Um, the, the, the strategy of argumentation is to say, look, I'm going to tell you this story about your view, which is so powerful and gives you access to such an enlightened self-understanding that you will, be, you will gravitate inevitably towards this story. Um, there's only one catch, which is at the end of the story, you turn out to be wrong. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so you will understand your view better than you did before, um, and as a consequence of that superior self-understanding, you'll realize that you're mistaken. Um, or, in short, uh, I can tell a better story about why you're wrong than you can tell about why you're right. Um, so I take this to be, uh, in, in many ways, the method. Um, in, in my moments of, of apologetics, I say this is why the books keep getting longer. Um, because the goal is to show to the opponent that you understand them better than they understand themselves, right? So, you know, oh, you atheists think you understand secularism. Um, let me explain secularism to you. Um, so that is, within this perspective, um, uh, a one way and a perfectly respectable way of, of, of um, doing moral philosophy. But I actually want to suggest a, a different way. And here, uh, I'll take it in what is admittedly um, an extremely non-Taylorian direction. But if you, ex if you accept this expressive view of moral vocabulary and of sort of the enterprise of moral philosophy in the last 2,000 years, um, another way in which you could approach the question is you could ask, um, what is the, the base vocabulary um, of morality? And here, there, you're obviously just a simple difference of philosophical temperament. But you could say, look, some of it's expressive vocabulary, but some of it's not. That is, some of it you could lose, and it wouldn't be disruptive to the practice. You could continue on as you had been. Um, you wouldn't have the, the ability to critically reflect upon it and to articulate certain kinds of things, but the practice would be undisturbed. Um, and there's other types of vocabulary which are, sorry, so you're going to have a kind of distinction between base and expressive vocabulary. And um, there are different ways in which you could approach that question. One would be an historical inquiry. You could look at the evolution of vocabularies. But another way in which you could approach that question would be um, cross-culturally. That is, you could look at different um, vocabularies that and different languages that people have used. So you could adopt an ethno-linguistic approach. And you could look at the kinds of moral vocabularies that are available within different human communities and different languages and look for variation. And in part, you would begin to suspect that if something was always present, that that might be a component of base vocabulary. You might discover that certain other things are completely absent in different um, views and vocabularies, which would lead you to think that they're, they're more expressive. Um, so I want to give you an example of how one could um, approach moral thinking in this way. And I want to pick up, um, actually, I want to go back to an idea in my uh, undergraduate honors thesis uh, uh, about Habermas's discourse ethics. I mean, one of the very central claims that, that one of the, the probably the, the, neat, I, the neatest idea 
uh, at the core of that program is a kind of linguistic reformulation of, of Kant. And so, you know, Kant has the three critiques, three different modes of, of reason. Uh, Habermas sort of translates that into a linguistic idiom by saying, you know, rather than theoretical reason, practical reason, we have assertions, we have imperatives, we have, we have avowals, we have validity claims that correspond to them. Uh, so one of the ways of reading the, the claim that Habermas makes uh, is that the imperative is the base uh, vocabulary of morality. Uh, not the assertion, right? So that it's, it's the imperative that raises the validity claim, which is then central to the normative regulation of social practices. Um, now, uh, what I want to do is pick up on that idea and show some of the support that you might get uh, for that idea from an ethnolinguistic perspective. And uh, to do that, I want to draw upon some, some recent work by uh, an anthropologist at the University of Chicago named Robin Shopes, um, who we had as a visiting fellow for a year at the Center for Ethics at the University of Toronto. Um, and um, so, uh, she d uh, does what I think of as a very old school ethnography, namely that she uh, went to Guatemala, uh, lived in a rural community and learned a dialect of Mayan, um, and then uh, transcribed, and, uh, recorded, transcribed, et cetera, et cetera, and did uh, an extremely sophisticated analysis of uh, the moral grammar of this particular um, Sacapoltec, a dialect of Mayan. And um, it's an extraordinarily interesting language, and what's interesting about it um, is that it, it lacks one particular piece of expressive vocabulary that's very central to our systems, and then there's enormous ramifications of that. Um, so what it lacks, the language lacks um, modal auxiliaries on verbs. So things like I will go, I shall go, you ought to go, and so forth, are all completely lacking in the language. You only have verbs. Um, and as a result, um, Sakapoltic has no equivalent of the word ought in it. Um, and you start to notice then uh, what the ramifications of that are, uh, and they're quite extensive because lacking uh, ought means that there's no mechanism to transform an imperative into an assertion without modifying its semantic content. I mean, so fundamentally what ought does in English is it allows you to take an imperative like do it and you can translate it into an assertion. You can say you ought to do it. Um, well, as it were, changing the modality but, but preserving the, the content and not adding additional content to it. Um, so fundamentally ought is an expressive device uh, that is, it doesn't, you know, correspond to anything. Although there are many philosophers uh, who have committed the formalist fallacy then of thinking that there must be some oughtness, must be some kind of, of, you know, metaphysical relationship between people in the world and so forth, and that we could inquire into the nature of oughtness. Um, an expressive analysis says, no, that you understand this primarily in terms of its grammatical role. Um, now, being able to transform an imperative into an assertion uh, is extremely important uh, from an expressive perspective. It allows you to do a variety of different things. The most important is that it allows you to take imperatives and use them as the antecedent of a conditional, right? which means that they can be inferentially articulated. That is, you can't, you can't embed an imperative directly in the antecedent of a conditional. Uh, that is, they can't be deployed inferentially. You have to turn things into assertions. That's a basic Brandomian point. You have to turn things into assertions in order to infer with them and about them. Um, the second thing about them is that it de-indexicalizes them. And so you can say not only you should do this, but also he should have done that and so forth, right? Um, so obviously it plays an important expressive role. And so often when, when uh, Robin comes along and says, yeah, they don't have any ought, um, and people express incredulity, uh, incredulity of that, they think, well, how could you possibly work without an ought? Um, and uh, as it turns out, what, the way they get around it is with a variety of devices, um, all of which are fascinating. Um, so one is that they have nine different um, inflections or moods on their imperatives. So depending upon, that are all phonetically marked. And so you can produce nine, a variety of different kinds of imperatives. Uh, English has only one. Um, French has two, right, with the, the use of the plural as a polite form, right? But they have nine. Um, and some of them are specifically uh, to indicate what, the, what your authority is, like why you are entitled to give the imperative to the other person. Well, so you have nine different ways of issuing imperatives. Uh, but you also have a heavy reliance upon quoted and indirect speech to the point where a lot of her transcriptions are trying to figure out, like you wind up with embedded, embedded, embedded quoted speech because you can't say things like he shouldn't have done that to condemn someone's actions. So what you wind up doing is saying things like, if I had been there, I would have said, don't do that. All right, so the imperative is the only way to articulate it. Um, they also have this uh, a very odd, um, what she calls a m moral irony particle. So if you want to condemn behavior, again, you can't say he should have done that or he ought not have done that. Um, so what you do is they state the facts that would have to obtain, in order to criticize behavior, they state the facts that would have to obtain in order for that behavior to have been correct, using a special phonetic marker that says, oh, and by the way, this is not the case. All right. uh, it's very complicated. Um, so 
there's one case where the, uh, the, everyone in the community agreed that this man should have left his wife. Um, but to condemn the behavior, they would say, um, it was as if there were no other women in the world. Negatively valenced. <laughs> um, so irony becomes enormously art. So irony in the sense of stating a counterfactual state of affairs with, impl with implied moral condemnation. What's striking about it is that you never have um, an assertion with the content of the norm. It's always the facts in the world that would have to obtain in order for the behavior to be have been correct, with implicit condemnation. Uh, and then finally, there, there's a, a variety of social rituals that involve a performance of imperatives. So you can't have something like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt, thou shalt, etc., because you don't have that expressive device. And so what they have, for example, before weddings is a ceremony where the bride and groom go through the room, and all the relatives stand there, and they issue imperatives. They say, do this, don't do that. Um, and so you have to have a performance of imperatives. Advice giving also always takes an imperative form. Now, this is, uh, there are clear expressive limitations, though, to this language. That is that um, um, it would be extremely difficult um, for us to articulate. In fact, so, so when she arrived and said, hi, I'm here to study your morality, um, people had no idea what she was talking about. Uh, it was only then when she got interested in the, I mean, so they, they gave her all kinds of bad tips on where they could find morality. It wasn't until she discovered the wedding ritual, she was like, I'm interested in this. And they're like, oh, that, you know, that. And, um, so the, um, one of the things that's striking about it is that there, there are essentially um, assertions in this community are not regarded as action guiding. And there is uh, almost a complete absence of evaluative vocabulary. Uh, so there are what we would think of as, as some thick descriptions, like something being shameful, meddlesome, and so forth, uh, and also good, bad. Um, but these are always associated with, with verbs. And so it was, never, it was never say, oh, that was shameful. You say, that gave shame. Don't give shame. Um, and so they're always in the active sense. Um, but in particular, people don't regard evaluative vocabulary as being at all action guiding. Um, and so clearly, the, the, you cannot articulate a moral judgment in the form of an assertion. And if you do, people don't regard it as being, as being relevant to their practical affairs. And one of the uh, odd, but I think really revealing consequences of this is that they don't take hints, um, which she discovered. Uh, and you start to realize then how deeply these expressive devices in, in, in our languages have affected the way we interact with one another. That is, most of the directives that we issue in polite company are not actually imperatives, they're indirect directives. So we don't say, do this for me. We say, you know, would you mind doing this for me? Which is actually a, a question, right? Or we assert something as an assertion. We say, boy, it's really cold in here. And then someone says, oh, would you like me to close the window? Um, so she found herself often saying things like, oh, it's really cold in here. And everyone's sitting around saying, yeah, it's cold. It's cold. <laughs> um, and she say, or there's, uh, she has a nice story about she, she had paid, a, what, doing laundry is very uh, time consuming, so she paid a woman to do her laundry. And so they'd be there and she'd say, she'd say, boy, my clothes are piling up. And the woman who's paid to do the laundry would look and say, yeah, you've got a, quite a pile there. And then she'd say, um, say, I was really hoping to wear that shirt on Tuesday. And she said, that shirt looks beautiful on you. That would be a great choice. And, um, and this went on like about five or six iterations. And finally, the, the head of the household was there. She, she, also, she's like, wait a minute. She says, are you trying to get her to do your laundry? <laughs> and she said, yes, I'm trying to get her to do my laundry. She says, oh, here's how you do that. Do my laundry. <laughs> Um, right, so, uh, it, you, and often they, that's how you treat a child, you teach a child by saying, you no, know, the way you get people to do things is you give them imperatives. You don't, you don't assert things about the world, right? Why would you talk about the world uh, when you want someone to do something for you? Um, now, needless to say, I mean, this community has a morality, right? There's no obvious distortions in their everyday social interactions and the nature of their practices and the nature of the norms, et cetera, et cetera. But what they do is they lack essentially expressive vocabulary. Um, I actually think this is um, deeply revealing. Uh, and so just sort of t two lessons. I mean, the first thing to say about it, um, you know, so the story is obviously grist for my mill. Um, but um, I think that there's two points. Um, the first is that it, it shows some of the, the advantages of, um, um, I mean, I, I've learned an enormous amount um, from Professor Taylor's work, and in particular, the essential um, aspect of it, having an historical perspective upon things. And partly, it's important to realize how much we're creatures of our own time and the extent to which things have, you know, the past is a different country. Things have been radically different. So adopting an historical perspective is absolutely essential to understanding the present. Um, but I also think that adopting a cross-cultural perspective is extremely important because there are certain things about us that are, that are highly contingent and yet so deeply embedded in our own history that it's difficult to see their contingency. 
Uh, and it's sometimes only when looking at a radically different language or different culture that you start to see that contingency. Um, so I want to make just a, a general brief for um, the cross-cultural perspective. Uh, and then also show that you know, within the, a broadly tailoring perspective upon morality, um, there's, a, there's a multiplicity of different methods that can be deployed. Um, and the hermeneutic strategy, um, the hermeneutic argumentative strategy uh, that Professor Taylor uh, adopts, um, I think has you know, been an extraordinary contribution. But I actually think that within the, that sort of general view of morality, there's actually a variety of ways in which we can sort of pursue the argument about the basic nature of moral judgment. Thank you. Thank you.